So Unit 13, Infection Control. So we discussed in Unit 12 uh, types of infection, and now we're going to talk about what we can do about it. So medical asepsis. So asepsis, the definition is the absence of disease-producing microorganisms. So very, very difficult to obtain. So medical asepsis, the, the goal really is reducing the numbers of disease-producing microorganisms or interrupting the transmission from one person to another. So it's pretty near impossible to have true asepsis, um, complete absence of disease-producing organisms. So we're really trying to reduce the disease-producing uh, or microorganisms organisms and then if you know we can't get rid of all of them interrupting the transmission from one person to another or from a person to a place or an object so hand washing so you will not hear stop us here stop talking about hand washing hand washing is the single most important health procedure any individual can perform to prevent the spread of microbes so really it's um, it's the mechanical washing away of different microbes on your skin so it is very very important um, and and again that's why it's the first skill that you'll get tested out by your state examiner because it's so so important in, in tr truly trying to stop the transmission of disease from person to person. So using alcohol hand cleaners. So you'll often see gels, you'll see foams, um, alcohol-based cleaners. So it's important to remember that you can use them. They're, they're definitely appropriate, especially here in Colorado, where you can have skin breakdown from the dryness from washing your hands too much. Uh, but it's really important to still remember to wash at the sink if your hands are soiled with a protein substance. Quite honestly, if your hands are just soiled, so I wouldn't try to determine whether or not it's a protein substance or not. Not. Really, if your hands are visibly soiled, you should wash them. And then also if the patient is known or suspected of having disease caused by spores. So we talked about that in Unit 12. Spores are not killed by alcohol, so it's important that you mechanically wash them away. So it's important if you have a patient with a spore-related illness that you're washing your hands frequently. So standard precautions, so it used to be referred to as universal precautions, and so sometimes you'll still hear that terminology, but the more appropriate term is standard precautions. So it's infection control actions used for all people receiving care. And so what's important about this is that you're automatically assuming if you're coming into blood or bodily fluids that the patient could be infectious. So instead of you know, a, you know know trying to determine is this blood infectious or is it not infectious, you're going to assume any blood or bodily fluid is infectious when you first come in contact with it. So PPE, so personal protective equipment for standard precautions. So how are you going to protect yourself when you come in contact with these blood or bodily fluids? So gloves, you will be using gloves very frequently. You're going to use gloves when you're touching blood, bodily fluids, secretions, excretions, contaminated items such as linen, mucous membranes, or non-intact skin. So basically anything that can transmit illness. And then you're going to use gowns um, when you're likely to generate splashes or sprays of blood, bodily fluids, secretions, or excretions. So something that you'd be getting it uh, on your uniform if you didn't have a barrier there. Uh, mask or respirator and goggles or face shield. So you're going to use this when you come in contact with clothing, exposed skin, and again, blood bodily fluids, secretions or excretions. What's really important to remember is generally you don't have to determine what standard precautions, what PPE you should use for a different patient. It's usually set forth by the facility you work in. And so you just have to make sure that you follow whatever they set for the guidelines for that particular disease process. So, you know, a great example is tuberculosis. You're going to make sure that you're wearing all the protective equipment, including an N95 respirator. And we'll talk about that. So A2 rooms. So this is rooms with special air handling system. So this is for people who have an airborne disease or illness. And so again, like the name sounds, it's transmitted through the air. And so it's very, very important that we treat the air in that room different than we would in the rest of the facility. So what these rooms have is negative air pressure so that the air is not going in, um, into the rest of the facility. So the air from the room is vented directly to the outside or directly through a filter. And this is important so that these pathogens that are airborne cannot escape into the rest of the facility. 
So there are such a thing called N95 masks, and these are high efficiency particulate air, or HEPA, respirators, or National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH, um, approved masks. And what this is, is it's talking about something where um, an airborne particle isn't able to get through that mask and infect you. So it's, um, it's taking kind of the basic face masks to the next level, and they're fit tested, so when you are wearing this type of mask, you've been fit tested, which means that they've tested this mask on your face for your particular um, facial type, if you have facial hair, or if you, you know, the type of your face, and so that it's an appropriate fit for you, so you're not, particles of certain sizes are not able to get through the mask and potentially infect you. So ultraviolet germicidal irradiation UVGI lights, these are used to eliminate pathogens in some isolation rooms. So it's really a second step to not only protect, you know, the negative air pressure room, but then also to try to eliminate some of these pathogens through germicidal irradiation. They're used intermittently as a secondary measure to kill or inactivate pathogens in the upper portion of the room or those passing through the air duct. So again, it's just a secondary measure beyond that negative air pressure to try to deactivate some of those uh, pathogens. So the anteroom, this is basically what's going to help also protect the rest of the facility from potentially um, the infectious air. So it reduces the escape of the infectious organisms when the door is opened and closed. You know, you can sit, consider it like a little bit of like a mud room. So it's basically keeping the air, the infected air in that isolation room. There's kind of a separate area that is going to serve as a buffer between the changes in the air pressure in the patient room and the hallway. So it's really basically a little room um, that kind of buffers the air. So there's figure 13-11 in your book, and I'll show it to you here as well. So you, again, you can see on the left-hand side here, this anteroom it has um, all the necessary things that you're going to need supply-wise. So you can have the trash, linens, all those kinds of things. And then again, it's going to buffer the hallway from the isolation room air. So additional respiratory precautions. So practicing respiratory hygiene and cough etiquette, so covering your mouth, covering your sneeze when you're coughing, sneezing. Um, containing secretion, so encouraging people to use a tissue. Um, covering the nose, and then obviously throwing the tissue in an appropriate receptacle. Um, covering the nose and mouth when coughing or sneezing, so you'll remember that picture from unit 12. <laughs> and, you know, making sure that the nose and mouth, that when there's coughing or sneezing, it's covered. And, you know, we often say, if you don't have a tissue, cough into your, cough or sneeze into your elbow. But it's really, really important that you also have clothing there that helps trap those particles. Uh, so using tissues to contain respiratory secretions, and then discarding the tissues in the nearest trash can after use. So selecting PPE. So again, this is important for your own personal protection. So you're going to select it based on the type of anticipated exposure. So what you're going to be doing, what kind of exposure, will there be splashes, will there be um, exposure to secretions. So whether you're expecting only touch or if there's splashes, sprays, excretions. So if, you know, as a respiratory therapist going in there suctioning, they're going to be exposed to more than if you're just going in based on a, a touch. Um, yeah, exposure. So the durability and appropriateness for the task, and then a fit. So especially with something like an N95 respirator, it's it's paramount that you make sure that it's a good fit for you before you're utilizing it in an isolation room. So the sequence for applying PPE. So again, um, donning and removing a gown and gloves is one of your skills for state test. And so um, we'll practice that in class. But the sequence is obviously wash your hands first and then you're going to don the gown, so put on the gown, and then put on the mask or respirator, put on goggles or face shield, and then lastly you're going to make sure you, you don the gloves. So rules for glove use. So you're going to always work from clean to dirty, and we'll practice this in skills lab. It'll make a lot more sense seeing it kind of tactile. Um, and then limit opportunities for touch contamination. So again, you know, the gloves are protecting you, but when you have dirty gloves, if you're touching other surfaces, you're then contaminating those surfaces. So making sure that you're protecting yourself, others, and the environment. So rules for glove use, so change gloves. During use, if they're torn, anytime your glove is torn, you're going to make sure that you 
remove that glove and get a new glove, okay? Or when it's heavily soiled. So even if you're using them on the same patient, if they're heavily soiled or if they're torn, you're going to definitely make sure you discard them and get a new set of gloves. And then obviously after use on each patient because we're not going to want to transmit things from patient to patient. Um, so also with rules of glove use, anytime you put your gloves on, you're first going to wash your hands. Anytime you take your gloves off, you're then going to wash your hands. And then discard in the appropriate receptacle. So never wash or reuse disposable gloves. So even in Skills Lab, we're not going to get in the bad habit of reusing gloves. I know they're they're clean. We're using them in a, um, a practice environment, but just really get in the habit of disposing of gloves. They are disposable. So sequence for removing PPE. So the first thing you're going to do is remove your gloves. Uh, you're going to wash your hands, remove your goggles or face shield, remove the gown, remove the mask or respirator, and then lastly you're going to wash your hands again. So where to remove PPE, and this is really important, and you often see in practice people not removing PPE appropriately. So you're going to want to remove it at the doorway before leaving the patient room or in the enter room if you're in an isolation unit. It's important though for a respirator, so you have an N95 respirator for a reason. You're not going to take it off when you're still in the patient's room because that's not going to provide you adequate protection. So a respirator you're going to make sure you take out outside the room after the door has been closed and then you can remove your respirator safely. So it's important that there's hand hygiene facilities are available so that you're making sure when you're taking off this PPE you're then able to wash your hands after that. So either a sink to wash your hands or an alcohol based hand rub um, depending on what's appropriate. So again not alcohol based hand rub if it's a spore related disease. So hand hygiene, you're going to perform immediately after removing PPE. You're also going to perform immediately before putting on your PPE. So if hands become visi visibly contaminated during PPE removal, so you're taking something off and your hands then become contaminated, you're going to wash your hands before continuing to remove the rest of your PPE, just as a protective measure.